Welcome to today's webinar on web logic, vulnerabilities, and the PeopleSoft impact. My name is Phil Ryman. I'm the Director of Business Development at Integrity, and I'll be the moderator for this e-learning session. Our speaker today is Stephen Coast. Stephen is the Chief Technology Officer and Founder of Integrity Corporation. He's been working with Oracle products since 1994, and for the past 17 years, Steve has focused on the security and auditing aspects of the Oracle Business Suite, Oracle Database, and PeopleSoft, and has written and presented on these topics at various national and regional conferences, including OEUG and the Regional Collaborative Conferences. I'll now turn it over to Steve. Thanks so much, Phil. Today, we're going to talk about the recent WebLogic vulnerabilities that have been fixed by Oracle in the October 2020 critical patch update. But these vulnerabilities have gotten a lot of press, and they've been <clears throat> published exploit code, proof of concept code for these vulnerabilities. And so we're going to today focus in on the PeopleSoft impact, because the Oracle PeopleSoft runs WebLogic as a web application server. And these vulnerabilities definitely impact PeopleSoft environments. So today we'll walk through the vulnerabilities and what you should do, be doing about them in a PeopleSoft environment. Before we get started, a very quick background about Integrity. Integrity is founded in 2002 by former Big Six consultants working on large ERP implementations Muted. like Oracle Business Suite, PeopleSoft. Back then, security was not being handled at all. Things like the apps password in Oracle Business Suite was not changed from apps. Uh, PeopleSoft, so people had the PS account with the password PS. So we developed a couple of products and provide services around these large ERP products like PeopleSoft on how to secure them. Our first product is AppSentry, and AppSentry is a security validation tool for PeopleSoft. So it scans the PeopleSoft environment, including the application, PeopleTools, WebLogic, Tuxedo, and the database to verify that that entire application environment is secure. We also have a proactive layer of security called App Defend, which is an enterprise application firewall specifically designed for PeopleSoft. So App Defend takes off and enhances where a typical web application firewall works, which has very little knowledge of the PeopleSoft environment. And App Defend provides a very robust layer of protection for PeopleSoft. First and foremost, virtual patching. So if you're not applying the Oracle critical patch updates immediately, App Defend provides that virtual patching between the time you <clears throat> learn about the patches through the critical patch updates and by the time you can apply them. Typically, that's 30 to 90 days. Also, for companies that are third-party support providers, App Defend provides a mitigating control against <clears throat> not applying the critical patch updates from Oracle. We also have a very robust consulting team. Uh, this is a world-class team of consultants that work with clients on a daily basis including performing security assessments. So going in and looking at your PeopleSoft environment at the database, at the application servers, at the people's tools, at the PeopleSoft application itself to make sure it's securely <clears throat> installed, configured, and operated. Also, when there's compliance issues and challenges, such as around PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, and SOX, we work with many different companies on how to actually make these applications both secure, but also compliant with a number of regulatory requirements. And then finally, we also do a lot of security design requirements definition around a number of add-on products that people often implement in a PeopleSoft environment, including Oracle TE, Oracle Database Vault, Oracle Audit Vault, and Perva, Guardium. So how do you actually best implement those products and get the true value out of them? And then finally, we're backed up by a world-class research team. So we're actively working, researching PeopleSoft security. What are our risks in the application? How do you actually improve the application security? How do you protect the application? Again, at all those layers, because again, you've got a database, you've got WebLogic, you've got Tuxedo, you've got people tools. And finally, we're an Oracle Gold Partner, so we have a very good relationship with the Oracle application development team, as well as the Oracle security. So enough about integrity, let's kind of jump right into the topic here and start talking about these WebLogic vulnerabilities. <clears throat> So Oracle released, as part of the Oracle critical patch update, October 2020, two vulnerabilities that impact the Oracle WebLogic server, specifically the council component. So these vulnerabilities alone are problematic, but when you combine the first two vulnerabilities here, it can allow a complete com 
compromise of the Oracle Web Logic, which is the underlying web server for the PeopleSoft environment. So I kind of walk through the columns here and also give you a little explanation about what this means. So this is taken from the Oracle security alerts. This is the risk matrix that Oracle provides. I'll kind of give you a few highlights here so you have a better understanding what some of these security vulnerabilities mean. The first column, column A here, is actually an identifier. It's called a common vulnerability enumeration or CVE code. And this is very useful because this is standard numbering of security vulnerabilities across the industry. So you can actually search for these CVE numbers in Google. It's also very interesting when you do it in Twitter to see what the discussion is around them. So when published exploits come out, it's actually labeled as with the CVE code, so everyone refers to the same vulnerability by using the same name. The component here is within the council. So this is the web logic council that's available within the PeopleSoft application that's used to manage the underlying web logic server. This column C is remotely exploitable without authentication. So can this security vulnerability be exploited as long as I can just see your PeopleSoft application server, can I actually exploit these security vulnerabilities? The first vulnerability is the answer is yes. The second vulnerability is no. And what's gonna be interesting is when we combine these two vulnerabilities, it will allow me to take over the entire server. So each one is not interest, as interesting alone, but when you combine them together, it's devastating to a web logic environment. Column D is base score. This is the CVSS base score. So CVSS is a way that you can kind of score vulnerabilities and kind of have an idea. So it's a standard metric that the security industry uses to say, okay, yeah, this vulnerability is on a scale of one to 10. This is a really bad one, or this one's not so bad. The first vulnerability is 9.8. So therefore I can compromise the web logic server. I can take over the entire server the reason it's not a 10 is actually, I can't take over the root of the operating system. If you're running on Linux or Unix, you've got the root account, which owns the operating system. I can't take that over, but a 9.8, I can take over the entire web logic server. I can execute code at the operating system layer. So it's a very devastating vulnerability. The second vulnerability is 7.2. The reason for that is it's not remotely exploitable without authentication. I can still execute things at the operating system, I can't take over the entire server, but I also need authentication. We jump over at column E. Column E indicates both I can read and write, that's the confidentiality. I can actually compromise the integrity so I can actually change things, I can write things. And then finally availability is I can bring the server down at a moment's notice. That one isn't as important, especially when I can read and write everything on the server. And then finally, the last column is the supported versions of WebLogic which are vulnerable. This column is key because it shows you which versions you need to be worried about, but also you have to understand that these are only the supported versions. So Oracle is only listing those versions currently under support from Oracle. Other versions may be vulnerable. Um, we've confirmed that all versions greater than 10.3 of WebLogic are vulnerable. We have not yet confirmed if versions eight and nine of WebLogic are vulnerable, but there's an assumption that they are at this point. So if you are running very old versions of WebLogic, they may also be vulnerable. So this column, just take as an indication that these are the versions supported by Oracle, and that's the only versions that Oracle tests off of this. So when we jump down to vulnerability three, vulnerability three is not actually its own vulnerability, but the way Oracle works is that when they do a fix, it has a CVE ID, so it's uniquely tagged. Vulnerability three here is actually a fix for vulnerability one. So when they fix vulnerability one, they didn't fix it completely, so they actually had to go back and do it. So on November 1st, after the CPU was released, and about two weeks later, Oracle released a one-off security alert, which are actually pretty rare in kind of the Oracle. They usually tend to do things as part of the critical patch updates on a very quarterly cycle. So it's a very significant event when they actually do these one-off security alerts. And the reason they did it was that the vulnerability was actually being exploited in the wild, that people were seeing compromise of web logic servers, therefore they had to jump on this immediately because there was an issue with the fix as part of vulnerability one, and they actually had to redo the fix and actually make it a little bit more robust because people were finding ways to bypass it. So again, one and three are intimately related. They're actually the same, a similar fix for the same problem, and two is actually a different problem. And we'll kind of walk through on how these work together. 
So let's talk about the three vulnerabilities in detail. So the first vulnerability, 14882, is an authorization bypass in the WebLogic Council. So I've got the WebLogic Council, that's what I use to manage, and we'll show you an example of that in a second. And I manage the WebLogic server, and it's available at the URL slash council. I can bypass the log in there, and therefore execute functions within the WebLogic Council that I shouldn't be allowed to do. This is a classic path traversal vulnerability, which means I, within the WebLogic Council, there's URLs, and I can actually move around the URLs by just doing a few little tricks, fake the application out, and it thinks that I'm actually authorized when I'm not. So I have full access to the WebLogic, <clears throat> WebLogic Council with no authentication. The second vulnerability, 14883, is interesting because it's really meaningful in the context of the first vulnerability, that if I can bypass authorization, is there something I can really do? So the second vulnerability, 14883, is a remote command execution within the WebLogic Council. So I can actually change the URL, play with the URL, and it will end up allowing me to <clears throat> execute operating system commands by calling certain Java classes. What's key is this requires authorization. And so in most WebLogic environments, the council should really only be executed by the DBAs. It should be extremely limited to who is allowed to access it. And oh, by the way, those DBAs most likely already have operating system access. So really there's nothing they can't do already. So this vulnerability is, yeah, okay. If I really had a lot of segregation of duties and I had a bunch of people doing this, it might be an issue. But in a PeopleSoft environment, it's really not an issue. Where 1483 comes into play in that if I can bypass the authorization and then I'm in and then I can execute something that would give me operating system access, whoa, that's really powerful now. Now I can easily compromise the entire server. I can compromise the operating system. I still can't get root of the server, but I can just do everything I want to the WebLogic server with really what I want to do. So these two vulnerabilities combined, 14882 and 14883, are devastating because I can take over the entire WebLogic server. Where the first one is, yeah, I can potentially do quite a few things. It's powerful, but when I combine it with a remote code execution vulnerability, it's, I, it's done, I've done everything. And then what's really powerful with these two together is that I can automate it. It's one URL, I, I do one request to the server and I've compromised the server. So it actually becomes very powerful in terms of I can now do this to many, many servers. I don't have to go in and server by server and spend a lot of time and do a lot of different things and try to work it to get access. No, I can automate this. I can have a, a script that as soon as I find a WebLogic server, I push one button, I've compromised the server. So these two together are very powerful. Hackers are after these because it's meaningful. I can start doing things. The third vulnerability is actually a fix for the first vulnerability. So Oracle messed up when they actually tried to fix the vulnerability. They didn't fix it completely. And people very quickly found ways to bypass the original fix because it wasn't complete. And I'll show you actually what happened uh, behind the scenes in a second. So again, very powerful vulnerabilities work together. And I can do quite a bit with them. So what's the authorization bypass? So you've got the WebLogic Council. And the WebLogic Council, and we'll talk about exactly where it runs in a PeopleSoft environment in a minute. But it's at the URL slash council slash login is the login page. And then once you log in, you get slash council, council that portal is actually where all the code executes. And then it, it's a typical web application and it kind of has pages and things like that. And so for a PeopleSoft environment, it'll be at like PeopleSoft council. And that's how I get in, depending on how my PeopleSoft environment is configured. Point three is the actual vulnerability is the WebLogic authorization can be bypassed by simply changing the URL and double encoding a path traversal. Anybody who's ever gone into Windows and gone into the command prompt and actually changed the directory and said cd dot dot back and you go back one directory, that's exactly what this is, exact same thing. So the images and the CSS cascading style sheets are basically just directories that have things that uh, doesn't really matter. Anyone can re see all the images of the council. It doesn't really matter. But what, what I can do is I can go into that images directory and access that images directory and do a little trick and say, oh, by the way, council, just go back one. I didn't really mean to go into images, go back one and just give me the stuff that's one directory higher, which is the council. 
However, the council portal is only checking at <clears throat> one layer of for authorization and said, oh no, you're looking at images, even though I told it to look at images, but back up one actually when you're doing it. So it gets confused and tricked and then will allow me to actually access the council without any authentication. So what a double encoding is, is a very classic old web application security trick if you're trying to hack into something. And so if they were actually trying to find the path traversal and they're looking for dot, dot, slash, they look for that. Or it's just simply encoded. And the reason you encode it is because the URLs get passed around and you need to encode it so it doesn't get misinterpreted at some point along the way. So you'd typically do a percent two E, which is the encoding for a dot, and percent two F is the encoding for a forward slash. And Oracle picked that one up too. So they knew they disallow dot dot slash. They disallow encoded the first layer of encoding for dot dot slash, which is percent two E, et cetera. However, what they meant, missed is you can actually do double encoding. I can encode it once and then I can encode it again. And that's kind of a trick. And web servers actually decode this. I do percent two five two E, et cetera. The web logic server will actually decode that to percent two E and then we'll decode that to dot dot slash. The application isn't expecting that and wasn't looking for that, wasn't blocking that specifically and said, oh, okay, yeah, let's do the path traversal. So within the WebLogic Council, they actually had code that disallowed some of this path traversal, so you couldn't exploit this, but the programmers just missed this double encoding concept. Therefore, I have a vulnerability. And that's how a lot of these security vulnerabilities work. It was just someone missed this, that there's a kind of a trick you can do. They hard-coded some things, and they weren't anticipating it. So that's the first bug. The second bug, which makes is becomes now powerful, is a security bug within the council itself, which allows me actually to pass in a Java class name, which is quote, called the helper function. And that helper function is then executed as part of the council. And this is typical. So when I do different functions within the council, it's calling all these Java classes based on kind of what type of object it is and things like that. Unfortunately, within the coding of the council, there wasn't a limitation on that. It's not just executing classes that I would anticipate. Someone missed and said, oh, why would anyone put any other class in there? We tell them what class to run. And they didn't realize that the coding of the council that, yeah, anybody can put any class in there. And as long if there's a class within the WebLogic council that's vulnerable, that could be used, it's really useful, like executing things at the operating system layer, the council just executed it blindly. And that's what someone found. Someone said, hey, I can just call this shell session class and it'll actually let me execute things at the operating system layer. So very simple to do, very effective. And so the bottom here is an example, if you're actually running this on Windows, you call the special URL, you pass in the shell session class and then it'll actually execute it. And if you're running this on Windows, it'll pop up the calculator. But again, I can do anything I want and what people are doing to exploit this is actually installing <clears throat> something on the operating system which will then let me actually mine cryptocurrency. And there's an anonymous cryptocurrency called Monero. So if I can do this on a thousand WebLogic servers, I can now use the processing power of a thousand WebLogic servers and use their, enter, their power and their server and the millions of dollars of hardware to actually mine cryptocurrency. And then I can come back in and grab that all after a, a week or so. And it's cash. I've just made 50, 100, $250,000 with not a lot of work. And that's kind of why these, they want to do these. In terms of what integrity you'd want to do, we want to actually compromise it, compromise your PeopleSoft environment, steal all your social security numbers and things like that. Uh, but typically that's not what people are doing at this point, but that is very feasible. These examples around just cryptocurrency mining are, is what people are exploiting, but I can actually compromise your entire PeopleSoft environment by doing this because again, I can execute things as the operating system, uh, compromise that web logic server, then potentially move around in your organization and do things. Because again, I've now gotten into that server. I've got operating system control. I can install my own web applications on there. I can do quite a few different things. So that's the first two vulnerabilities. The third vulnerability, 14750, is actually a fix for the first vulnerability. So the first vulnerability, the fix was, hey, they're double encoding the URL for our path traversal. We just need to block that, right? That's pretty simple fix. And it was actually a pretty simple fix. 
unfortunately, it was too simplistic because they just put in that hard-coded line that said percent 25 2e, da da da, block that. However, what the pro, whoever did the fix missed was, oh by the way, lowercase works too. So they hard-coded that one, the first string there with an uppercase e and uppercase f, and didn't realize that, oh by the way, I just have to change it to a lowercase and that works too. So the second fix will actually fix both uppercase and lowercase, and what they're actually doing is just doing, putting it all to lowercase and comparing it then. So even if you try mixed case, it won't work now. Um, so the fix seems effective on the second round, but again, the programmer who did it the first time did it wrong, and therefore we have to have a second fix. That's what the third vulnerability is, is a fix for the first vulnerability because there was a bypass in the initial fix provided by Oracle. So let's kind of jump out to a PeopleSoft environment here. So again, depending on how, and we'll talk about this in a second, you deploy PeopleSoft. So this is a classic PeopleSoft web application server running WebLogic. Um, in this case, with the WebLogic version, we're running 12 to 140. So definitely vulnerable. And again, this is just a classic PeopleSoft. And now if I actually type in console here, if I change the URL here, I can go to the WebLogic console. So I've got access to it. So we'll jump back to the presentation, or actually I'll just grab it here. And if we now change the URL, and so now what I've done is just put in the direct URL, but I've actually tricked it and put in the special, the special double encoding path traversal. And that will we'll go to it. And so now I'm right into the WebLogic Council. Bang, I'm in. I didn't have to authenticate. I now have access in here. I can actually do a number of different things. I can now come in and see the PIA domain is running, um, that it's configured, that it's okay, it's running on port 8000. Hey, I'm in, I'm doing it. I can now potentially do different functions in here. As you see, all the images aren't working correctly, and there are some issues in here. It does take me a little while. Everything doesn't work perfectly. I have to actually tinker with the URLs at a different point to actually get some things going. But as you see this handle up here, I have access. And this is in the URL where I highlighted, you can see how they use handle and it's a different Java class. And based on the function of this page, that Java class will change. That's where now I can put in that shell session and actually now execute commands. So I actually only had to do this once. I didn't even have to actually navigate around it. Again, I can just do one URL, send it to the WebLogic server, and I'll just start executing that stuff at the operating system layer. Otherwise, I can come in here and try to monkey with this and play around with it. I could actually potentially do some deployments of applications. There are some capabilities that I have within here. It's not 100%. There are some limitations on what I can do. Um, there are some security checks in certain places, but other places there aren't. Um, so just depending on what function I want to do, I can do it. Again, the most effective is to use the second vulnerability and execute something at the operating system layer. Uh, but again, I'm in, I've got access to this, and I'm actually potentially very powerful in terms of what I can do. So how do you fix this? So Oracle has released two different patches, and the critical part here is there's two different patches. So when I'm updating the WebLogic server, and again, when the infrastructure DPKs come out, these will be included as part of that. But I have the WebLogic patch that update for October 2020. And again, I've got the my Oracle support note here on where to find that. But then there is an overlay patch. So that first patch that update is the standard WebLogic cumulative update that updates for also previous CPUs, but it does not include, and it has not been updated to include the third vulnerability, which is the fix for the first vulnerability. In order to apply and fix this completely, you need to apply both the patch that update for October 2020, and you need to apply the overlay patch for October 2020, which is really a fix just for the single item. There is a special My Oracle support note that gives you the detailed patch numbers based on version uh, for the overlay patch also. So again, a typical going to Oracle support, you got to go to multiple MetaLink nodes and kind of work through the process, figure it out exactly for your WebLogic version and get these applied. Um, there's ways to do this as part of the DPK process, um, but I'll kind of just highlight the high-level patches here. 
So now the question becomes, <clears throat> how do I test this? Once it's in, what should I do it to actually test to make sure that my patches are effective? So again, you can use these URLs. So here's the URLs, and everyone will re receive a copy of the presentation um, after uh, probably around tomorrow. So you'll actually get these URLs and you can actually test them after you've applied the patches. And it's pretty easy you, because again, you pop into the WebLogic Council. These aren't anything that's very sophisticated to test. It's actually very simplistic and you can actually test both vulnerabilities by checking it in lowercase and uppercase to figure out what the issue is. If it is fixed, it will return you a 404 error, which is a <clears throat> web error for page not found. So if you get a 404 error, you know the patches are applied for appropriately. If the council is displayed, typically with missing images, make sure you're not logged into the council when you're attempting this. Make sure you log out before you attempt it. Then you know that the patches aren't applied. I included both URLs so you can actually have a little understanding about, okay, the first patch is applied and the second. So if you do the first URL here and it returns a 404, and then you do the second one, but actually returns the web council page, you know you haven't properly applied the second patch. Um, so this is kind of a simple way to test it. Um, there's not a lot of security vulnerabilities that are this easy to test, uh, but this is one example, and we do definitely encourage you to kind of test it, make sure it's working or not working. So in the PeopleSoft, this becomes a little bit more complicated when we're talking about the WebLogic Council. Because again, this is in the WebLogic Council. So is this vulnerable internally, externally? How does this work? What am I vulnerable to as part of this process? It depends on how you've actually installed PeopleSoft. So PeopleSoft has a couple of architectures for WebLogic. So it's called the WebLogic Managed Server Architecture within PeopleSoft. And I can either actually do it as single server multi-server domains, or something called distributed managed servers. So single server is everything's installed. There's a single PIA domain. The same URL for, is for the WebLogic Council as the PeopleSoft application. So if you've got the single server, the WebLogic Council is part of. So just as I did this example, if I go in here and connect, I'll well actually just connect to the application. And we have tested a number of PeopleSoft environments on the internet and they're vulnerable. They have the council running externally. So if I just, again, this is a PeopleSoft login page. If I just go to the PeopleSoft login page and get rid of this part and just type in council, I'm in. I'm, I've got, I'm connecting to the council. And we've tested a number of PeopleSoft environments on the internet who are using self-service, things like that. They are running the council. So this is actually happening. So these are not blocked at all cases. You can also use the multi-server domain. So in the multi-server domain, within the web logic, they actually do something called the domain. And that domain kind of controls the application and the deployment of the application, things like that. And in the multi-server domains, you actually have multiple deployments. And what they do is actually one deployment on one server is the web logic admin, which includes the council. So that would therefore then be typically running on the default port of 99999 and all hosts are allowed. So again, anyone connect connect to it. And the WebLogic node manager also runs on that WebLogic admin. So you may not be running via the PeopleSoft typical application URL. It may be on a different port. In this case, if you're running multi-server domains, the default is 9999. Um, so depending on how you're running, the WebLogic Council may be in a different point. If you're running distributed managed servers, which is actually just an extension of multi-server domains, it actually works the same way. Um, so how you handle this and what you do about it kind of depends on your architecture. So definitely go in to the PeopleSoft application, go to the URL, put in council, see what happens. Does it come up? Then you know that's more vulnerable. If you're running externally, definitely do that check if it's running or not. So what should you do about this? Is the vulnerability accessible if you can't connect to the council? And the answer here is if you can't see the council, you can't exploit these vulnerabilities. That's very, very important on this. So there's no reason, especially if I'm running PeopleSoft externally, that anyone that should ever see the council, WebLogic Council externally. So you should always block access to the WebLogic Council externally in the single server mode. Then the next step is how do I restrict this externally? So if you re restrict it externally, you can do that in the load balancer, the reverse proxy. Internally becomes a little bit more of an issue because potentially I'm running 
and using that so the DBAs need to connect. So there are a number of different ways I can actually restrict access to that, especially if I'm using a load balancer or reverse proxy internally, if I'm using a web application firewall. So you need to review your options and it changes based on every client on what the best way to do it is. The other thing that you need to be doing the WebLogic Council, WebLogic is a really interesting product um, if you're kind of want to geek out here for a second and really kind of go deep down. It's interesting that when you have this WebLogic port, it actually runs on multiple protocols. So when you talk about WebLogic, it's actually running HTTP, a protocol called T3, which is used for WebLogic administration, LDAP, and something called IIOP, which is an interoperability protocol. It's running all these protocols over the same port, which is very unusual for a technical solution to do that. Typically, if you have a different protocol, you run on a different port, but actually WebLogic allows you to run these all on the same port. So when you're trying to figure out to block the council, we also strongly recommend that you disable these extra protocols. And there's actually a pretty good MetaLink note out there that gives you some information about how to do that. And it is actually Oracle's recommendation to disable at least the T3 protocol. We also recommend you disable all three protocols that are unnecessary in a PeopleSoft environment. If you're running a multi-server domain, again, WebLogic Admin is running on a separate port. The council is using the WebLogic Admin as its domain. Therefore, you can actually do some more things. Within WebLogic, there's actually very powerful security filters that allow you to actually restrict access to the port and who can connect from what IP addresses. And so now, because you're not, if you were running it, when you're running it all together in a single server mode, you can't use these security filters because you'd block the standard application traffic. <clears throat> but when you're running in a multi-server domain, you've got this running on a separate port 9999, typically, which is the default, you can actually put in these very sophisticated security filters to restrict access who can actually connect to that domain and therefore the WebLogic Council. And at the same time, again, we strongly, suggest you're restricting access to all the different protocols, especially the T3 and IOP protocols, because a number of web <clears throat> of Oracle WebLogic security vulnerabilities have been patched in that uh, over the years. Um, so as an example, also, these don't get as much attention because as part of the October 2020 critical patch update, there was actually three security vulnerabilities in the T3 protocol. So the ones that got attention were the WebLogic Council with the just going into the, the authorization bypass, but there's three other very high risk vulnerabilities in T3. So again, don't overlook the T3 because that allows access. And so anyone can write different <clears throat> programs to actually access and use T3 to compromise the server also. So the connection filters are powerful, but again, you can't do this if you're running the single server mode because you'll block normal application traffic. But if you're using the multi-server mode, definitely put in the connection filters you go into the WebLogic Council under Domain Security Filter, and then you can define filters. And typically, the most robust rule would be you set up a couple rules that allow the server to connect to itself, to manage itself, and then you block everything else. That would be the most robust rule. And that question is, how are you actually operating WebLogic? Are you using scripting? Is that scripting running from other places? Um, so if you're running all your scripts from the local server, you can block access to everything except the local server. Otherwise, if you want the DBAs to connect, be able to connect to the WebLogic Council, you actually need to add in then some additional IP addresses and things uh, for them to do that. And you can do subnet domains, um, so you can provide, hey, if you know where the DBAs are on your internal network, you can provide potentially just that subset. If you're using jump servers or, or bastion hosts or Citrix or Microsoft terminal servers, you could allow just those, so the DBAs in order to manage WebLogic Council, and if they have to go into it, would have to first go to a jump server, log in there, and then use that jump server, which is fundamentally just a remote desktop, to actually then connect and manage <clears throat> WebLogic. So that is always a strong way to restrict access to different things, and especially at, around the, the database access. So if you want to really secure your environment using things like James, jump servers and bastion hosts, is actually a good way to do it. The one key thing about like the T3 protocol, if you are doing scripting, and there is the WebLogic scripting tool, WLST, that uses the T3 protocol. So when you're doing the T3 protocol, you have to have that enabled. So if you are doing WLST scripting, beware those scripts might break and you actually have to monkey with these rules and play with these rules to make sure you have the appropriate access. 
And then the last thing on these protocols is you see the T3 and the T3S. Each of the protocols has a secure version. So T3 is unencrypted, T3S is encrypted. Um, again, like HTTP, HTTPS. You may not be running the unsecured protocols or you may not be running the secure protocols. But again, we always recommend you just block both at the same time and <clears throat> for consistency and make sure just in case that anything changes in the configuration over time, you've got it in place when you need it. So that's fundamentally kind of very straightforward ways to fix uh, this issue. Again, you have to spend some time and effort to make sure the council is appropriately restricted. If you are on the internet, again, people are looking for these environments. So people are actively searching for these uh, WebLogic servers because again, they can monetize it. They can make some money. So they're going out looking for these. There's actually security search engines out there that actually go through and crawl through the internet, looking at web servers and basically cataloging them, gathering the information, trying to figure out what they are, are they running web logic, and then give you a very nice interface. It's like a Google search engine, and but it's dedicated to finding servers, and you can just type in things like web logic and it'll pop up. And so there's actually attacks against and people scanning this, going after these. The one nice thing about PeopleSoft, and this also applies to Oracle e Business Suite, is it doesn't leak out that it is a web logic server. So when people are actually going into these tools, when you type in WebLogic to find WebLogic servers, PeopleSoft and Oracle e Business Suite are not showing up in those search results. So that is actually a positive thing. We don't have any indication of any compromise of any of our customers yet, um, but we are very closely watching this and we see, are seeing active compromise of just standalone WebLogic servers that are on the internet. And we'll show you a very quick example here. If we'll go into Shodan. And again, this is a search engine, so I'll just type in WebLogic. And it just fine, it goes out and it's now giving me a list of WebLogic servers. Again, some of these are older versions. This is WebLogic 6, WebLogic 7, things like that. Um, but again, it's just giving me a list of them. That's how easy it is to find these servers out there. The nice thing is PeopleSoft doesn't advertise itself. Um, Actually, if you spell it right, it... so for the enterprise sign-on, it does. But for a typical server, it doesn't advertise itself as much as other applications. But again, what it's doing is it's connecting and it's finding certain pages. Um, and again, if I want to find PeopleSoft servers, it's not that hard. Um, all these servers popping up very quickly, uh, very easily, and you can go find them. Um, so. Anyone who thinks that their PeopleSoft environment is hidden on the internet, it's not. Again, it's very easy to find, um, very quick to access, um, and it's not that big of a deal. And again, I just did a quick search and I actually found 815 PeopleSoft environments who are connected to the internet. This isn't rocket science. So again, you always have to be aware that you potentially are under attack. <clears throat> so one of the major reasons for this presentation was that these attacks are active today. So people are actively attacking WebLogic servers. And there's the SANS Internet Storm Center, ISC, which actually has sensors and what they call honeypots out on the internet that are actually tracking this information. It's actually, they're looking for different types of attacks against applications. And so like they have a WebLogic honeypot. So it's just sitting there waiting for someone to attack it so they can analyze those attacks and say, hey, somebody's actually doing something out there. Someone's actually actively going after WebLogic. And the Internet Storm Center has found active attacks. They also watch for different port scans. So you can look at like port 7001 is the classic port that the WebLogic Council is deployed on in many cases. And so as you can see, 500 times a day on average, somebody, and these are just against their sensors. So this is, they've got 500 people hitting their sensors every single day for looking for, hey, is WebLogic running on this? Is WebLogic running on this? And so this doesn't tell you how many actual scans have happened on the internet, but how many, how many times it's actually hit one of their sensors to say, yeah, we just saw a, a scan for port 7001. Um, and we could also check 9999 um, and things like that. So as you can see, there's active people looking for WebLogic servers. They're actively exploiting this out in the wild. So it's very important to say, 
if I've got people stopped running, I've got a single server mode and I've got the council deployed externally, somebody might be coming after it. The other issue here is don't forget about all your other Oracle products. Um, so again, WebLogic is a core for many of the Oracle products out there. So WebLogic is the web application server for PeopleSoft. It's also the web application server for Oracle Business Intelligence, OBIE, Oracle Coherence, Solus Suite, Identity Management. So if you have any of those other products, those products also may be vulnerable just depending on their uh, versions and deployments. Um, so again, this takes a little bit of time to figure out, okay, what do I need to patch? What should I be blocking? Um, the council is active in a number of these other applications. So if I've got Identity Management, Access Manager deployed externally, <clears throat> is that an issue? Is the council accessible on that? Um, by default, typically no, but depending on the version, it might be. So with Suite, the council is definitely available. OBIE, the council is definitely available. So again, you need to be spending some time working through these other products that you might have. If you, <clears throat> if you have one takeaway from this presentation, this is it, in that WebLogic vulnerabilities are here to stay for a while, and this is not going to be the last time that this gets a lot of attention and people are looking at it. These three bugs, 21 security researchers were accredited, accredited with finding these bugs. Typically, you might see three people, you might see five security researchers, but to have 21 people actively researching and discussing and working on exploit code and talking about these bugs and then reporting it to Oracle. So these are the people that reported the bypass bug to Oracle. So that's a lot. That's not just like, hey, a couple of people are figuring this out. To have 21 re security researchers working on something means that they're going to be looking at other things because they want to find the next hot thing. These guys are not doing this just because, hey, I want to do it. It's kind of fun. I want to look at this one bug. It's like, no, I want to find the next WebLogic vulnerability that gets a lot of press and I can get some notoriety. But I can also now take these security vulnerabilities and sell them to different services, or I can actually monetize them through some of the bug bounty programs, which say, hey, then I look at vulnerable WebLogic servers on the internet, and some companies will pay me uh, like $500 if I actually tell them, hey, your WebLogic server has actually a major vulnerability. So we definitely anticipate and predict that there will be a number of these high-risk WebLogic vulnerabilities coming out in the future. So you need to be planning accordingly that WebLogic is vulnerable. There are very specific issues in WebLogic, and there's a lot of core components in WebLogic. So in a PeopleSoft environment, the Web Services Atomic Transactions was the one in 2018 that got a lot of attention. Again, there's, most of these features are not used in WebLogic, so therefore they should be blocked. So you need to be spending some time proactively hardening and protecting your WebLogic environment to block all that unnecessary traffic. So within what PeopleSoft, there's a very core set of URLs, so flash PSP, flash PSC, but then there's WSAT, there's Council, all those additional URLs within the WebLogic server should be blocked um, at the external point. So if you are especially deployed externally on the internet, you should be blocking as much of this as possible by using your web application firewalls, your load balancers, your reverse proxies, all have very robust uh, filtering capabilities. Um, so we'll be working on deploying, sending out some additional information in the near future, talking about what are some of the key things within WebLogic that you need to disable and how to protect WebLogic better. Um, there's a number of resources. We've got a quick um, security reference guide for PeopleSoft. That includes some of the things that you need to be definitely locking down on PeopleSoft. And we'll also have some WebLogic presentations on our website at integrity.com. It gives you a lot more information on this and how to actually lock down WebLogic proactively. But again, if there's one takeaway from this presentation, this is not going to be the last time that there's a serious, critical WebLogic vulnerability that's exploited in the wild. Um, we anticipate probably for the next year, at least every quarter, there'll be one or two because this has gotten a lot of attention. And people like this. It's been low-hanging fruit. These are pretty simple security bugs. These aren't anything rocket science. Therefore, we anticipate there'll be actually uh, at least several more, probably two or three more, if not five or ten more. Another way to help defend your application is by using AppDefend. Again, AppDefend is the enterprise application firewall designed for PeopleSoft. There's nothing else on the market like it. And it's providing this virtual patching cap capability. It's fixing your PeopleSoft security vulnerabilities 
because if you aren't patching, if you aren't applying the patches immediately, AppDefend will provide that layer of protection for you and will also provide a layer of proactive protection. So as part of the last critical patch update, about 60% of the PeopleSoft vulnerabilities were already fixed by AppDefend because it had the capability to block those generic type of attacks already from the application. Um, it also provides additional logging because some of the logging within PeopleSoft, you actually have to enable by default. You have to do customizations to get appropriate logging. AppDefend does that instantaneously with a couple of different rules. And we actually have cookbooks around all that to actually let you do a very sophisticated application logging within PeopleSoft that would take you a lot of time to do otherwise. Uh, it's a very robust two-factor authentication solution if you're using things like Duo Security. You want to use Duo Security with Oracle, with Oracle PeopleSoft. AppDefend actually lets you implement that very quickly without any other third-party products. And then it also provides a layer of protection for web services and some of the other features found in PeopleSoft. So that was a, kind of a very high-level overview of the Unmuted. project vulnerabilities and how to actually protect your environment and giving you a little bit more information about how you should move forward on them. And again, we're not seeing much active exploitation today in PeopleSoft. But we are definitely seeing on WebLogic servers, and it's just a matter of time before people realize that PeopleSoft has WebLogic and will actively start researching and going after those directly if they haven't already. I will turn it back to Phil to see if he's got any questions. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, question for the console. Does anyone else have besides the DBA need access? Yeah, definitely not. The WebLogic console is really purely for the pure management of the uh, WebLogic server. And the DBAs are really the ones that should be controlling that. And if there's any customizations that need to be done, that probably should be going through the DBAs anyways. So really the answer is no. And that's why you can restrict it so well. And again, if you can restrict access to it, any vulnerabilities in the council kind of just are blocked and you don't really have an, even have to worry about them. Well, that's the only question we had this, this afternoon. Um, so I want to thank everybody for spending time for us this afternoon and have a good rest of the week. Take care.